Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. So, um, it's like 10 o'clock at night. Why are we leaving so late to get to the thing? It's not till like next Wednesday. Yeah, but we have to drive there. And you know how Tom is about driving. But no, no, it's Dan's turn to drive, and Josh's turn to drive, and Tom just... <laughs> so, who's driving? Well, I drove... Jesus Christ, Tom, what did you do? What did I... Oh, yeah, yeah, me. Because I totally have the power to open a giant portal in downtown. That's what I could do, because I'm an editor. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I was a superhero once, so... Hang on. I think I see someone coming through. Oh, God. This better not be the ghost of Sean Connery again. Yeah, that joke's getting kind of played out. I know. They are again. God! Oh, my God. Look at those abs. Yeah. I don't need this for a friend, man. What? No, 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 no. Oh, jeez, I feel like I'm having a stroke just talking to this guy. Hey, I know your name. I know what I'm trying to know you and never met. Ich habe in Breed Kongat. Ja, ich habe in Breed Kongat. English, motherfucker, do you speak it? I do speak it. Hang on, guys, hang on. There's someone else coming out of the portal. It looks like a floating laptop in a robe. Hey, maybe you can help us, because this guy's... Do I know you? You look really familiar. No, I am a new character and not at all Tom 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 Bart from Season 2 Eat the Scientist Murder All Humans. Oh, for oh. oh, great! Now we have an invading horde to deal with! This day just gets better! Well, if past experience has taught us anything, gentlemen, the cops are going to show up any minute now and blame all of this on us. So I say it's time to go. Yeah, we can't afford any more of those legal fees. Besides, we have like a really long drive. Wait, do, 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 do you not want to save the universe with us? Ah, enjoy us. Uh, yeah, sure. In fact, why don't we? Hey, what's that over there? Oh. <laughs> Isn't it weird to anyone else that all this battling and portal opening stuff is going on downtown and no one seems to notice? What battling? What are you guys talking about? Josh, th- that, that thing that's behind us that we're driving away from, I still see it in my rear view. Drawing blanks there, buddy. No idea. What do you guys want to do? Yeah, yeah let's, let's watch a movie, movie guys. guys. Masters of the Universe Super Saturday Super Power Hour! Tune into the Fire Pit Podcast on the last Saturday of the month and join Dan, Tom, and Josh as they watch movies based on some of the greatest 80s Saturday morning cartoons ever! Yo Joe with G.I. Joe Retaliation. Yo Joe! Transform and roll out with the Transformers. Transform and roll out. Jam out with Jam and the Holograms. Then take on Skeletor with Masters of the Universe. It's Marshmallow Cereal and all your childhood memories. And it's only at the Fire Pit. Who needs school when weekends rule? Good morning, bots and listeners! We welcome you back to the fire pit. I am Tom at Arms, Earth name Tom, and we are finally here, finally at the end of our Super Saturday Super Power Hour. We saw massive explosions with Transformers, more massive explosions with G.I. Joe, and saw a massive explosive dud with Gem and the Holograms. But now, we have the power! 
And now to tell us about that power and what we're watching, I'll share the power with Josh. Well, thank you, Tom at Arms. Josh here, also known as Mecha Josh. And as Tom talked about, on this journey, we've watched G.I. Joe. We've seen some Transformers transforming. And we watch some Gem and the Holograms, Gem and the Hologramming. So and that's totally what they do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They didn't do a very good job of it. No. But but there is a theme to this, all right. Because, you know, if you're starting with this episode, well, you know, shame on you. Go listen to the other ones, then come back. Or don't. If you like this one, watch it. Whatever. We don't care. We can't police it. But anywho, you've noticed the theme though, right? Saturday morning cartoons. What a better way to top off the list than with the Saturday morning cartoon toy line that started it all. Masters of the Universe. The 1987 action fantasy film that was based on the mega popular toy line of the same name. Now, to get a rundown and kind of find out what we'll be in for, let us share the power with Battle Dan. To you. Thank you, Josh. Wait, Battle Dan wait. here. <laughs> Dan just shared all the power with me. Oh, Jesus. He got oh, it everywhere, man. He got oh, it everywhere. Oh, oh, the power of grade school. It's, in my it's everywhere. It's in my that's, what, that's what he means by it. Oh, gross. He said the thing. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Battle Dan here, otherwise known as Dan. And today is finally the day. We discover the secrets of Castle Grayskull in 1987's Masters of the Universe, starring Dolph Lundgren, Frank Langella, Courtney Cox, Robert Duncan McNeil, Meg Foster, and the principal from Back to the Future, who also played the Enterprise captain way back in Top Gun, making him what, Tom? Say it. To Pete. Ha <laughs> <laughs> he said the thing. <laughs> he did. He reluctantly said the thing. Yes, Tom is right. James Tolkien is a fire pit to Pete tonight. Uh, back to movie figures. The movie was, again, released on August 7th, 1987. It had a budget of $22 million and a box office of $17.3 million. So didn't make its money back. Uh, it was rather disappointing. Has since emerged as m somewhat of a cult classic in the annals of time. However, it does have a Rotten Tomatoes score of 21% with an audience score of 42% uh, and an IMDb of 5.5 out of 10. So... Gem and the Holograms may have only held the record for like a week or so. This may be one of the lowest rated films we've ever watched. Uh, it's certainly in the top three. But still not, not as low as Gem and the Holograms. So we've actually moved on up, guys. This is an improvement. Woo! I have seen this movie within the last year. And while I will admit that it's not great, um, I think uh, it's more fun than Gem and the Holograms. It's certainly... You know, yeah, critically, it probably deserves its 21%, but it's not as bad as it could say a gem in the holograms film. So whatever. But I'll, I'll get into that when we get into expectations. So, yeah, one of, one of the lowest films we've ever watched, but I think we're going to have fun watching this. I personally wanted to do this movie since we started this podcast a long time ago. Um, I remember those conversations. It's like it was practically like, hey, can we do can we do Masters? Let's do Masters, guys. Are we doing Masters? Yeah. Yeah. Dan, Dan's kind of had a hard on for this movie since, well, we started this podcast. Because it's got a good story. Of like, I don't know. It's just today. Well, I don't know. Now it, it seems like uh, there's a lot of backlash with franchise type films based on IPs. Like we're seeing the MCU kind of in the middle of a downswing right now. Um, yeah. The DC universe is definitely being rebooted at the moment. Um, Again. Um, other like franchise type films, like the last Transformers movie didn't make as much as the ones before it. G.I. Joe Snake Eyes wasn't a big box office success. So eh, maybe these movies are starting to see a little bit of a downswing. But at the time I wanted to do this movie, I couldn't believe that at the time this movie was being made, it was based off of a major IP. And yet every time they turned around, the production company was taking more and more of the budget away from them or mm -hmm. forcing them to do massive rewrites because they had to work within the budget they have. So to me, that's just like, I don't know. I just can't see it like happening today. Like I, I couldn't see them making a Iron Man movie and saying, well, you only have $10 million. What are you trying to say here, Nigel? Are you saying this movie did not have as easy a time as, say, the Transformer films might have had today? That came out literally 20 years later? Yeah, wow. Yeah, well, we talked about that when we did Transformers. Like, 
how the executive or some of the producers wanted some different changes to the Transformers, but even guys like Michael Bay and, and Steven Spielberg, who was the executive producer of that film, stood up to those producers and said, no, that's stupid. Yeah. Or no, that, that doesn't make that doesn't make any sense because the franchise it does it this way. Like, you know, we talked about how like one of the producers wanted to be like, maybe the Transformers shouldn't talk. Maybe the Transformers shouldn't actually speak and it should just be the human characters talking. And then even Michael Bay was like, dude, they're already going to rake me over the coals for making Optimus Prime a long nose truck. Uh, I'm not going to have him not talk. <laughs> yeah. So mm-hmm. like they respected the franchise enough to stand up to the studio and be like, no, we're going to try to make this as close to the original cartoon slash comic book slash toy line as we possibly can. You know, yes, some concessions have to be made and some, made, and some changes do have to be made for the sake of making it today or basing something that was based on like basically a half an hour toy commercial and making it into a two hour feature length film. But those changes are made with respect to the franchise. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. A lot of the changes made in this movie while I would say are somewhat respectful to the for the franchise are still kind of like definitely the, the studio interfering on a massive scale. However, it did later inspire certain other things that have now occurred in the masters of the universe franchise and different reboot cartoons and different reboot comic books and stuff like that. One of which is there is no Prince Adam in this film. They don't mention him as Prince Adam. The other characters who do know he's Adam, like uh, man at arms, uh, man at arms has always known that Prince Adam is he man. Man at Arms never once calls him Adam. He always calls him He-Man. Mm-hmm. And so there's no Prince Adam in this or in this movie. However, Prince Adam is actually a later addition to the Masters of the Universe. In the original Masters of the Universe comic book, He-Man was not Prince Adam. That was just uh, the original like comic book shorts that came with the figures or something like that well, before the toy line really launched proper. He-Man wasn't Prince Adam. He was... Uh, he was just He-Man. Yeah, he was just He-Man. He was just a dude. I can't, he didn't even really have a name. He just became He-Man when he got the powers <laughs> of Grayskull. And mm-hmm. he actually originally got his powers through his harness, not his sword. Oh. So is, is this like the original cartoon or like what led up to the cartoon? This is what led up to the cartoon. The original comics, He-Man doesn't get his powers from his sword. He gets his powers from a harness. That's why the different He-Man action figures had different harnesses on. Oh. That's why the harnesses could be removed on the original action figure line. And that's and his harness would change based on what powers he would use. That's why like power punch He-Man had a different harness than laser He-Man, you know? So now I, obviously that's another way to just sell more toys, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the sword became the source of his power in the cartoon, the filmation cartoon. Ah, the animators are basically like, I'm not going to draw 15 different He-Man. This right. is the early eighties. We ain't got the budget for that. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. So yeah, his, his powers came from his sword starting in the filmation cartoon. Same with the the other stuff that we associate with He-Man by the power of Grayskull, holding the sword up to the sky and getting shocked by lightning and then transforming into He-Man, the Prince Adam thing. That stuff came from either the later comics or the Filmation cartoon. So Mm -hmm. I'm saying this, that their movie has no Prince Adam in it, but it's not because, oh, we wanted to stay true to the original comic. No, they don't have Prince Adam in because of budget reasons. I remember that being a slight, uh, not scandal, but some fans kind of being a little pissy about that too back in the day. Well, I think because... You know, part of the charm, I guess, of He-Man is his transformation. Mm -hmm. That's usually a big moment in the cartoons when Adam finally raises his sword to the sky and says, by the power of Grayskull. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a big moment in the cartoons. It always has been. So imagine if they made a Superman movie and they said, no, Clark Kent. Yeah, that would be fucking weird. That would be yeah. weird. Or even worse. Imagine if they made a Spider-Man movie and they said, no, Peter Parker. Yeah, that'd be weird. I, I, really I, I think people would be pissy about that. Just a little pissy. Yeah. But one of the reasons why they couldn't use Adam is because one, they didn't really have the budget to do like a transformation sequence. Mm-hmm. And two, they kind of thought it was a little foolish that Adam, who in the cartoon, he looks exactly like He-Man except with clothes on. And hey, He-Man just looks like Adam wearing nothing but a loincloth and some boots. So, so they just kept it as Adam and He-Man are one person. Yeah. Yeah. But. This did actually inspire later reboots of He-Man starting in like the 2002 series that was on Cartoon Network. And now the newest like Masters of the Universe Revelation and Revolution that the Kevin Smith cartoon on Netflix is that Adam looks remarkably different from He-Man. Adam looks like a child, Mm -hmm. kind of like a Shazam thing. Like Adam kind of looks like an 18, 19 year old kid. And He-Man is a big buff Conan the Barbarian looking dude. So dude, yeah, and those cartoons fucking like the transformation makes the transformation from like scrawny Steve Rogers to Captain America seem like 
dude, are you okay? Yeah, and it would, also be more, it would be way more believable that someone like Tila, who spends every waking moment like with Adam and also every waking moment with He-Man, Tila wouldn't be able to figure out that Adam is He-Man and He-Man is Adam because they don't look the same. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. that did later on inspire some of those cartoons. Some other little bits of trivia about the movie. One I want to talk about is Frank Langella. Frank Langella loves this film. He still to this day talks about it as one of his favorite roles of all time. He speaks about this movie very, very fondly. He even added lines to the movie for Skeletor. He got into character in added lines of dialogue. One of the biggest lines of dialogue was when he's talking to He-Man towards the end of the movie. And he says, tell me about the loneliness of good, He-Man. Is it equal to the loneliness of evil? Because that, that it was him, like he was him getting into character and him adding that line, like like he would be like he he and his delusion would think he and He Man are one and the same person. Mm-hmm. And He Man He Man being the hero he is would think I'm nothing like Skeletor. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, but that's Frank Langella. That's that's a serious actor taking this movie seriously. You know what I mean? Like, for a character that was normally known for saying "you bumbling buffoon," right? You're saying, <laughs> yeah, just kind of being a silly little like skeleton dude in the con the original cartoon like, <laughs> yeah, so, kind of character yeah i don't know i like i have a lot of respect for someone like frank langella who is a really good actor like he really is a very very good actor who gets into a movie like this and is like i'm going to take this seriously and i'm going to act my ass off in it <laughs> and i'm going to be the best character in this film a, a more recent example i know you we haven't watched it on the podcast yet but if you guys have seen it it's a bad film but it's transformers the last night Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Anthony Hopkins is fucking brilliant in that film. Anthony Hopkins is so good in that movie that like the scenes he's not in, I just like, I don't care about the rest of this movie. I don't care about the Transformers. I don't care about Mark Wahlberg's character. I don't care about anything else going on. Go back to Anthony Hopkins because again, he's a very good actor who's taking a very bad film seriously. Mm, Yes. So isn't that the one that gave us a concussion? No, that would be uh, the the first of the Wahlberg ones. The uh, age of extinction is the one. Yeah. Jesus, yeah. No one was taking that movie seriously. Yeah. I thought it was last night. No, last night is the last one that they made before they rebooted it with Bumblebee. But oh. it's a bad film. Like last night is really bad, but Anthony Hopkins is fantastic in it. Oh, of um, course. Uh, but anyways, but that's that's what I love about Frank Langella. Uh, the other starring actor in this, Dolph Lundgren. Dolph Lundgren used to be kind of embarrassed about the film. He wasn't happy that it didn't really launch his career like he thought it would. He doesn't have a lot of fond memories about most of the production, mostly because they treated him kind of like shit. Uh, He had to have it specifically written into his contract that they wouldn't dub over his voice. They were threatening almost every day to dub over his lines because they didn't like his accent. You know, I don't remember it being that bad when I was a kid. Yeah, it's not. He had it written into his contract that he got four, three or four takes. And if he got it right on any of those takes, they couldn't dub over it. So he would take three or four takes to do a line, but he was still fine. His accent was still pretty thick at the time. This is actually, I think, his second or third major movie after Rocky IV. Mm-hmm. And he hardly talks at all in Rocky IV because his accent is still very thick in Rocky IV. Although that plays into his character in Rocky IV, so it's fine. Yeah. But mm-hmm. his accent was still pretty thick at the time, and he was still definitely going through speech coaches. Think, uh, you know, think Arnold Schwarzenegger and like Conan the Barbarian or Arnold Schwarzenegger and like some of his early films. Like he had that really, really thick Austrian accent. It got softer mm-hmm. as he became more seasoned as an actor. And same with Dolph Lundgren. If you watch Dolph Lundgren now, you, he, his accent's still there, but it's not anything that's not ineligible or, or intelligible. It's like flavoring that. nowadays. It's, yeah. it's a little pepper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But he wasn't too fond of the production. However, he has since come around on it. Uh, he participated in a documentary a couple of years ago called The Power of Skull, where he spoke very favorably of creating an atmosphere with the practical effects of the 1980s. He has also said that it's one of the few films in his filmography that he could show his children and grandchildren without having to worry about the content because he's mm-hmm. he's an action star. So he does a lot of like bloody action films mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of movies with a lot of F-bombs and stuff in it. So this is one of the few films that he can show his kids and then later his grandkids without worrying about the content. And he has, he's never said, he hasn't signed on for anything, but he said, I would definitely be open to doing something in another live action He-Man group or He-Man. Yeah. Like, yeah, he could play like uh, King Randor, like Prince Adam's dad, or even like he could play a villain. Yeah, Or or you can even like have him be like uh, uh, King Grayskull, the the, the original like He-Man, the one that's supposed to have the the, the first person Mm -hmm. that gave every one of them the powers. Like you could do something like that with him. And I think it would be kind of cool. And mm-hmm. audience members like me would be like, yay, <laughs> you know, but this He-Man, this version of He-Man has later been um, kind of redeemed. Uh, he became the hero in a major big selling comic book storyline. And uh, yeah. he finally got his own action figure 
a couple of years ago. There's a Masters of the Universe toy line called Masters of the Universe Origins, I think it is. And there's multiple different versions of He-Man that they've released. Well, they finally released a movie He-Man and it has Dolph Lundgren's face scan and all that. So he finally got an action figure. I'm happy for the guy. Wait, he didn't have one back in the day? Nope, they did not release a He-Man that looked like the He-Man from this uh, movie. Really? Uh, until more recently. So, and I'm happy for the guy because it is not his fault that this movie did not do well. It is not his fault. Whose you know? fault was it, Nigel? <clears throat> I would say Canon Films. <laughs> They're the ones that kept pulling the fr- the rug out from people. So, oh, I've got some notes on that too in a bit. Oh boy, do I! Oh. And the, the last thing I'm going to say, trivia wise, is for those not familiar, younger audience, um, Masters of the Universe really is the first of the cartoons based on a toy line. Um, It actually used to be illegal until the 1980s to basically just make a show based on a toy line that all toy lines before then were based on either movies or existing properties, existing TV shows. So things like Barbie and GI Joe, which do go back to the sixties did not have their own cartoon. And then like the big action figures, probably before He-Man were the original star Wars figures from the 1970s, but those are obviously based on the star Wars films. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the exact law and I didn't, I forgot to look it up. So I'm not going to just BS it, but it has something to do with some kind of law that was put in place around the time Ronald Reagan became president that allowed for new IPs to be created basically based on nothing. So He-Man was the first one created for, for the sole purpose of we're going to sell as many toys as possible. And the cartoon is going to be for the sole purpose of selling toys. Mm -hmm. That's, Exactly what it is. So they had different rules. They weren't allowed to use the same characters except for He-Man and Skeletor. And I think Man-at-Arms and Evil Lynn and Tila were the only characters that were allowed to be used in every episode. But like other characters had to be rotated out. So that's why like some episodes he'd have Ram Man helping him out or other episodes he has Mechanic helping him out or other episodes he has Stratos helping him out. Sometimes Skeletor sends Trapjaw to do things and sometimes he sends Beast Man to do things and sometimes he sends Merman to do things. That's because they had to keep rotating them out because so, they had to keep <laughs> selling toys. Can you be imagine being the guy that has to come up with the names for some of these guys? Like, yeah. fuck, man. I just he's got two heads. Um, fuck. Um, um. Double punch. Yeah. I don't I don't know, guys. I just I'm so tired. <laughs> Let me go right. home. Right. And other franchises eventually followed suit. G.I. Joe was rebooted from the bigger figures that were about the same size as a Barbie to the three and a half inch uh, or three and a quarter inch figures that could fit into all the different vehicles. They had the same rules. Only certain G.I. Joes could be used in every episode and they had to keep rotating out the, the roster to sell more toys. They also couldn't use like the same vehicles in two episodes in a row because again, sell toys. Mm-hmm. Um, Transformers had the exact same rules and uh, I'm sure Jim and the holograms had similar rules and and. Uh, stipulations too and later shows that we haven't done yet like teenage mutant ninja turtles and all that all of these had the same kind of rules they were simply made to sell toys mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which is exactly what they did and for all of its faults it kind of worked we still remember these franchises fondly although I, it's not really done as much today anymore though i don't think but I no not really not shelves. really it does kind of look like the action figures that are on the toy shelves now are based on existing ips like i mostly see like marvel figures on the shelves now and dc figures and i do see some he-man but now they seem like they're more marketed towards the collectors not the kids like i don't see a lot of no, kids the people anymore. our age yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so i'll mm-hmm. have more trivia as the episode goes on and, and, and one more thing no i'm just kidding uh, <laughs> <laughs> tom um what about uh you got some production notes i mean i obviously i have a ton of production notes so i'm sure you've got some too Oh, I do. I mean, you're speaking of canon. I've got one or two things to say about that. Okay. So welcome to the production section, listeners. Today we are looking at Masters of the Universe. Tagline, the live action motion picture. Summary, the heroic warrior He-Man battles against the evil Lord Skeletor and his armies of darkness for control of Castle Grey Skull. Uh, as Nigel has already said, this is based off the 1980s cartoon He-Man Masters of the Universe. Either of you want to kind of summarize a basic episode of uh, He-Man for our listeners out there who may have be, maybe have never seen an episode? I honestly didn't wasn't into He-Man as a kid. So well, I Josh is a little younger than us. By the time you were really starting to get into things, uh, the toy line and the cartoon would have been past its popularity Mm -hmm. so nigel what would be what's the basic premise of any uh he-man episode 
Uh, Skeletor and whatever minions the writers decided to sell an action figure for that weekend uh, would do something, either attack a palace, uh, try to attack Castle Grayskull, or do some other nefarious evil thing. Man-at-Arms, Prince Adam, Tila, and again, whatever uh, action figures needed to be sold, um, would go and investigate. Hilarity ensues. Uh, Adam transforms into He-Man, punches a bunch of things, and then solves the problem in like five minutes. And then uh, everyone goes home. And then there's usually like a PSA at the end of it of like, you know, hey kids, uh, you know, bullying people for being, you know, weird looking is bad, so don't do it, you know. And then that was it. So for context for some of our other listeners, He-Man was basically a magical girl cartoon, only with a dude. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Think Sailor Moon, only, you know, bigger muscles and less clothes. And they straight up they straight up gave him a Sailor Moon transformation in the new cartoon. The, uh, the Netflix <laughs> cartoon, he absolutely has a Sailor Moon transformation. It's awesome, but he finally has a transformation. He has a Sailor Moon transformation. <laughs> I love that they just finally embraced it after all these. It's like, yes, He-Man was the first magical girl. But with muscles. And a loincloth and a big ass sword. And he's I always twi- liked the meme that it was like girls nowadays, they're trying to do the whole like support a non like anorexic look and everything like that. And like, we need to make sure girls self image is taken care of and we want to promote a healthy lifestyle for them. And then the next one's like, and this is He-Man. Yeah, you know, I was still, like <laughs> no shirt and just wearing a loincloth and some boots and got a big ass sword and way like over exaggerated muscles. Like yeah. if he was an actual <laughs> human, he would be dead. Yeah. <laughs> you look at the rock, guys, and um put hair on him and boom, you've got He Man. No, 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 no. Imagine the rock and double it. Dear God. Dolph Lundgren was actually cons- um uh, they almost didn't cast him because he was too small. <laughs> And they realized that the actual look was unrealistic and impossible. Yeah, and computer generated graphics didn't. He's, and he's absolutely cut in this film. Oh like, no! Yeah, the the, the, the images crazy. are this like Jesus God. There's no there's no fat on this man. Christ. Yeah. The '80s, ladies and gentlemen. But we're we're getting distracted here by big, oily, half naked men. That's but yeah, the way. Sorry, I, I went to a place. Moving here, on. <laughs> but yeah, that's. Movie, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was sci fi mixed with magic and mysticism. You had a character who could uh bench press the moon, there was actually an episode where he did that. And you had your side characters, you had a talking tiger, uh, you had guys unironically named Fisto and Tongue Lashore. Uh, but uh, so this movie, the basic premise kind of carries on with that. The, we have our character He Man and his heroes. They have to stop Skeletor from taking over Castle Grayskull, and they wind up in our world, 1980s America. And there are reasons why that happened, which we'll talk about as we discuss this film. But while the cartoon series is heavy on action, high on budget, and soft on plot, in the right hands, this could have been a Star Wars kind of film. But in the wrong hands, dot, dot, dot. So whose hands were trusted with this ice cream cone? He finally said, getting to the point. Well, technically, this was a two-prong production. The first prong of this was Mattel, the toy company who had the rights to He-Man and was also responsible for bringing us Barbie. Dan already mentioned the second half of this one, and this is what's got me so excited. The Canon Group. Nigel, Josh, can either of you name a Canon movie, by the way, aside from this one? Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. Boom. Yes. For contrast, Canon got its start in the late 60s, early 70s, producing English language versions of Swedish porn films. (laughs) What? Yes. (laughs) What an origin story. Right? But in the late what? 70s... Yes! Yes! <laughs> they started off dubbing Swedish porn, guys. And, and then by the 80s, they said, hey, this whole VHS thing is picking up. Maybe we should get our foot in the door. Those of you out there who watch Red Letter Media know this company because their show, Best of the Worst, has whole episodes dedicated just to the films of canon. Their filmography reads like a Troy McClure resume. It's like, hi, I'm Canon Films. <laughs> you, write, you might remember me from such films as The Happy Hooker Goes to Hollywood, American Ninja, 
and break into Electric Boogaloo. Pretty much, yeah. Yes, and almost none of them have more than 30% on Rotten Tomato. I made up none of those. Uh, It's such a list. In terms of writers, did they get anyone with any experience writing action or fantasy films for this film? Technically, yes. They got David O'Dell, who wrote The Dark Crystal, which is a cult 1980s film made by Jim Henson. If you haven't seen it, look it up. He also wrote Supergirl, which sits at 8% on Rotten Tomatoes. So he's got 50% of what it takes to make this film. But unfortunately, they took his script and sent it to Stephen Tolkien for some rewrites. Stephen Tolkien, you might know as being one of the writers of Captain America, the 1990s one. You know, not the, good, the not one the good. with the rubber like ears. Not the, not the good one. Oh, it even gets better. The other guy they got to help him out, Gary Goddard. You might know him as the writer of Jurassic Park, The Ride, pre-show video. <laughs> so a halfway competent writer whose script was then given to not competent writers. But at least the cast is interesting. We can say that much. First off, as Nigel said, Dolph Lundgren, who was coming off of Rocky IV. All muscles, blonde hair, perfect for, you know, a blonde hair, muscly cartoon hero. And Frank Langella as Skeletor, who, again, mwah, chef's kiss. You want a villain, he's the villain. And he plays everything as serious as a heart attack. Whether he's the villainous judge in the Aaron Sorkin film, The Trial of the Chicago 7, or a one-off villain in an episode of Deep Space Nine. And plus, the man sounds like a villain. Just mwah, so good. And plus, as trivia... This is one of the first roles of Courtney Cox, who the majority of us out there would know better as Monica from Friends or Gail Weathers from the Scream franchise. So, again, two guys that fit the role, one that was more excited about it than the other, and at least, you know, one now set up actress that you look back on and, you know, kind of maybe possibly get some kick out of seeing her in her first role. To summarize, Masters of the Universe is a two minutes too late cash grab made by Studio Infamous for the wettest of spaghetti with a Frankenstein script butchered by amateurs, directed by a novice, but starring people. Oh, I didn't even mention the director. Oh my God, keep going. (laughs) Yeah, this is going to be quick. Yeah, so the director, he also wrote Jurassic Park, The Ride, the pre-show video. And this was his like first and really only film. So as I said, directed by a novice, but starring people who at least kind of fit the role and some of which were excited to be there. Now that we know all that went into making this film, Josh, how did it do? <sighs> Masters of the Universe. Like we said, it premiered August 7th, 1987. It has a runtime of about an hour and 46 minutes. Total domestic gross of around $17 million. And internationally, $313. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I was expecting a million at the end of that. No, no, no. 313 At least that's what Box Office Mojo um, according to Box Office Mojo, it legit only ran for three weeks. So it pulled in $4.8 million on its opening weekend. And, uh, yeah. So it's opening weekend. Let's see. You guys, uh, yeah, you're not even going to be able to pick, figure out. But the number one movie that weekend, pulling in $7.7 million, mm-hmm. The Living Daylights. It premiered at number three. Like I said, pulling in 4.8. Yeah. Um, other notables on the box office that weekend was La Bamba at 4.4 million. The Lost Boys at 4 million. Robocop at 3.9. Other things that was still in the box office was 11 Full Metal Jacket pulling in 2.2 million. Mm-hmm. 13 Beverly Hills Cop 2 pulling in 1.3 million. And um, this is a familiar one that has been discussed before. At number 19, Superman 4, The Quest for Peace, at $1.0 million. Wow. I didn't realize Lost Boys and RoboCop came out the same year. Yeah. Um, do you guys know, want to take a guess at the number one grossing film for 1987? 
The only hint is we've had this trivia on this podcast before. The highest grossing film of 1987? Mm-hmm. Top Gun. No, Top Gun's 86. Hmm. Not uh, RoboCop. I'm blanking. Um, not, not, back, not Back to the Future, because that was 84, I think. I'm... Oh. Was it was it a Star Trek? It couldn't have been a Star Trek. Nope. Was it a Star Trek? No, I don't think it's a Star Trek. It's Star Trek. You said we've had it before, John. Have we had the movie on here before? We've had this trivia, this exact question before on this podcast. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to think. Is yeah. it Beverly Hills Cop? Is it The Untouchables? That came out in 1987. Tom, what's your guess? I'm going to go with um, Die Hard. Beverly Hills Cop 2. Damn I it. was close. Uh, <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop 2 pulled in $153 million that year. Jesus. Number two highest grossing of 87 was Platoon at $136 million. And number four, I'm going to skip number three, but number four, The Untouchables at $76 million. There's The Untouchables. Wow. That's actually kind of a stacked box office. Oh, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just tell you a couple of movies that came out that year. So, um, Lethal Weapon, Predator, yeah. La Bamba, yeah, mm-hmm. Crocodile Dundee, oh, RoboCop, yep. Full Metal Jacket, yep. Spaceballs, Damn. Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. I knew there was a Star Trek that came out that year. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Oh, Good wow. movie. The Running Man. Really? I always associate... Oh, wait, no, I'm thinking of um, a different running movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could just go forever here, because we got The Lost Boys, The Princess Bride, Harry and the Hendersons, Inner Space. Remember that one? Uh... Hoosiers. Ooh. Uh, Jaws the Revenge. That's a good one, right? 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 Anyone? Anyone? It's Nobody? Really okay, that's fine. Of all the Jaws films. Um, ooh, Battery's Not Included. But uh, did okay. you know where Masters of the Universe ranked for 1987? 65. Damn it, I was going to say 69. No, no <laughs> that was Burglar at $16.3 million. But uh, yeah, there was that was a good year for movies. And one of the ones that made a lot of the money was not this movie. No. But it is always interesting to kind of think that uh, the highest grossing film for a year was 153 million dollars that's almost a weekend for some of the most popular films nowadays yeah but the budget for that was like probably a quarter of that and it made money whereas nowadays yeah they're making 700 million dollars in the box office but it's costing them 900 just to make it with the um advertising Let's say 153 million so if we just fast forward to 2019 that movie would have been number 17 on the box office. Mm-hmm. It would have beat out Detective Pikachu. That was the same year Avengers came out too. Or uh, Endgame. Mm. No shit. Still though, man, 1987. I, I think I remember talking about this when we did The Untouchables. How just how great a year that was for movies. Like just, that was every weekend you had something to go and watch. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And a lot of those things nowadays, if it's not a Marvel or Star Wars or anything else like that, it's going to barely break and now you had freaking Hoosiers on there. You had, what was the, the, the number two box office of the year again? Um, platoon. Platoon. I, an anti-war film. Yeah. Oh, Three Men and a Baby and The Secret of My Success were also in the top ten that, that year. Yeah. Oh, so Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket's another anti-war movie too. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Secret of My Success is just Michael J. Fox, you know, just in an office. It probably cost him what wouldn't even buy most people's coffee in Hollywood today. Oh, and yeah. All the money. Just straight bank. Oh, yeah. Movies back then. I mean, if you even look at the top five movies in terms of, like, how complicated these are. Beverly Hills Cop 2, Platoon, Fatal Attraction, The Untouchables. We've seen that one, so we know how involved it is. Three mm-hmm. Men and a Baby and The Secret of My Success. Those have got to be some cheap-ass productions. Well, I think a lot of it also, too, is we are in a time in culture where media is just everywhere. I mean, back then, your Secret of My Success and Three Men and a Little Baby 
were like simple films, but now we can just, I can, I can go on to YouTube and watch like one of those for free. Like people can make those on a shoestring budget. Back then you had what, seven channels, maybe HBO. I'm curious. What did, was, uh, do they have Secret of My Success's budget? They do not. But no, that, that movie couldn't have cost too much. Probably most of the m- money on that one was just actors. Uh, yeah, paychecks. Paychecks, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Michael J. Fox was the hotness at that point in time. Oh, yeah. But... He had just finished uh, Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Doc Hollywood was coming out next. But I know he didn't release, what was it, Back to the Future Part Two until 1989. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that was the next movie he started after this one. Secret of My Success, at least. Yeah. But I mean, if you look at the box office in the night or the late eighties, like here, there's not a lot of sci-fi. I mean, yeah, we had inner space, the running man predator. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's just a handful. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at and Star that, Star Trek and such too, but yeah, yeah just someone coined them uh, on the internet, mid budget films. They're not super cheap, but they're not super expensive. It's just middle budget. Yeah. Really but I mean, some com- movies nowadays have budgets like 10 times what the highest grossing films of these ones have. And that's still a, drop in the bucket to some bot budget budgeted films nowadays yeah but those mid-budget ones like secret of my success we we get them everywhere it's like five thousand channels four different streaming services seven if you include like tubi in them it's, oh you yeah can go anywhere oh yeah we, you can like any ad supported or no yeah so it's those simple films which back then would have been a lot better than what they would have got on tv for sure uh both in terms of you know, quality and story. Oh, Just, for sure. Yeah, you know, we get those every Yeah, story focused movies. Yeah, who does that anymore? Fuck that noise. No. But right. anywho, thank you, Tom, for helping me expand my section. I appreciate it. You're welcome, Josh. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. Just, you know, stretching that runtime. Well, you are the expert. <laughs> but um anywho, Tom, what is your expectations for this film? Not the secret of your success, which is helping me expand my section. <laughs> Great segue, Josh. <laughs> nice. Great segue. That's what I'm here, for. What well I'm here for. Absolutely perfect. We practice these episodes. But um I don't I don't know to be honest with you. I loved this movie as a kid because I was absolutely just a fiend for Masters of the Universe and He-Man back in the day. But, but, can't ignore a lot of the stuff that went into the film (laughs) and just all, I mean, yes, special effects are just going to be better with each passing generation, plus or minus how dedicated the studio is to actually trying, cough, cough, She-Hulk, cough, cough, most of the uh, comic book films coming up anymore, but I I can say this much, guys. After Gem and the Holograms, my expectations are I'm going to enjoy this film at least. Because canon films, say what you will about them, they are dumb fun 90% of the time. Yeah. So even if it's a shit film, it's a shit film I can laugh at. So I'm expecting it's going to be absolutely god-awful. But I'm going to be really glad we're not watching Gem anymore. <laughs> yeah. Those are at least my my expectations. And maybe, just maybe, I'm I'm hoping it'll be like our tango and cash in some capacity. I'm not Have expecting. Have you seen this film before? Once. Way long ago when I was a kid. I think my, I did my dad take me to uh, the theater to see it or was it a uh, drive through I think he took me to the drive-in to see this way back in the day. I couldn't tell you like half of the stuff that happened in the plot aside from, you know, He-Man fighting Skeletor and just the guy that wasn't Orko that was supposed to be Orko. That's it. But I, again, I was a dumb kid. I loved it. I even had one of those action figures like the... um. What was the name of the guy that had the eye patch? Um, Blade. 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 Yes. They made a p- toy of him, by the way, but they didn't make one of the star. He-Man. Ugh. But so that's my expectation. I had fun with it as a kid. I loved it as a kid, but Kid Me also loved Weekend at Bernie's too. So if that <laughs> tells you anything, Kid Me just like whatever was on the plate. As long as it was flashy, I liked it. Um... 
Who's next? Who's got the expectations? Josh, what about you? What, what are you hoping is the secret of this movie's success? <laughs> uh, well, I have seen this movie before, but I think I was in the sing- single digits when I watched it. So I have vague memories about the whole thing. And I honestly, I don't remember a lot about it outside of memes. But uh, like you, I really enjoyed it when I was a kid. Um, It's like Dan touched on earlier. I kind of missed the He-Man Masters of the Universe uh, phase. Mm -hmm. Because when this movie came out, I was almost four years old. Mm -hmm. So um, not really my cup of tea. So like movies or cartoons, Saturday morning cartoons and stuff for me um, was more a couple of years later with the, the real Ghostbusters and like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Which makes sense because Ninja Turtles comes out in 87, Real Ghostbusters is 88. Um, Yeah, so that makes sense that those would be the toys that you remember. Mm -hmm. That's what I loved. Like, I remember loving Transformers and wanting them, but I don't have memories of watching the cartoon as a kid because it was already off the air by the time I got to it. Um, But I love the toys Transformers, but I didn't have the TV show. Uh, I would watch the occasional G.I. Joe, but He-Man? I had a couple He-Man action figures. I had no idea who they were but they were just in my toy box. Like there was mm-hmm. one where a dude, Jack short dude with like a red mask, red, red and black mask. Yeah. 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 I have no idea who that was, but he was in my toy box. So I remember seeing him periodically, like when I got older and I'm like, Oh fuck. I remember that dude. No idea who it was. And didn't even realize it was from he man until like I was almost an adult. So my, but I know I love this movie, like fucking, it's a movie from the eighties too. So, I mean, come on, if anybody who's watched <laughs> or listened to one episode of our podcast, we know that, you know, we have massive erections for eighties movies. <laughs> We've never done an eighties film ever. Never, not at all. But, um, all honesty, I haven't watched this movie with an objective eye ever. So I've got a lot of nostalgia fueling it. So I'm expecting it to be a terrible film that I'm going to absolutely enjoy. I'm on the fin- or I'm on the same board as you, Thompson. I want this movie to be a tango in cash. But are you expecting it to be? No. <laughs> <laughs> he says reluctantly? Question mark. I don't know. I don't know. But um, those are my expectations. Nigel. Mr. I've seen this movie in the past year and have been wanting to watch this movie on the podcast almost since the beginning of time. I don't know. I, I have a soft spot for this film, obviously. Um, I think it's fun though. I think it's a fun film. It's not good. It's not a good movie. I'm not going to sit here and say, Oh no, it's an underrated gym. No, no, it's, it deserves its 21% rank on rotten tomatoes. Okay. Um, but honestly, some of the faults of the film are not the faults of the actors. Like it's not Dolph Lundgren's fault that this movie didn't do very well. It's not Frank Langella's fault that it didn't do very well. Um, it's definitely Canon film group, but I mean like going back to Canon films though, I got a soft spot for them too. Like they've done a shit ton of action films that were like in my usual rotational staple when I was growing up, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. not just masters of the universe. But they did like Sylvester Stallone's Cobra. Like that's, that's right. Yeah. Did they? Yeah, they did Cobra. That's actually their biggest hit. Like it was made on a budget of like 20 some million dollars and made like 170 or 165 or whatever on a on a 20 million dollar budget. It was like their biggest hit. But um, yeah, they did Cobra, which I've always liked that film. It's a stupid action movie. I like it. They did the American Ninjas movies, which I admit now are kind of corny and dumb. But when I was a kid, I loved the American Ninja films. Almost every major Chuck Norris film was actually done with Canon. He had, he had an exclusive contract with Canon in the mid 80s. So uh, Invasion USA, the Delta Force, uh, Firewalker, uh, Missing in Action. Almost all the major like Chuck Norris films where all the Chuck Norris memes come from are all mm-hmm. Canon movies. And those were, again, movies in my regular rotation. Some of them I owned and some of them I always got either got out of the library or got out of the video store when I was a kid. Like I watched Canon movies all the time or they'd be on TV. They would just be on TV. So, like I said, they they make a lot of, like, schlock action, but I like them. Um, Hmm. But this movie, uh, I have pretty good expectations. The expectation I have of this movie is that we will have fun watching it. I don't think it's going to be a Tango and Cash because Tango and Cash worked because the actors were able to play off each other and do really well in that. Whereas this one, while the actors do play off each other, it doesn't have that humor to it. Like, Mm -hmm. it doesn't have that lightheartedness that Tango and Cash did. But I think we're going to enjoy it. It's definitely not going to be, like, Mythics, where... (laughs) We were hating life almost the whole time we were watching it. Um, I don't think it's going to be like Gem and the Holograms, even though it has a similar rating on Rotten Tomatoes, where like we were miserable that whole movie. 
Um, Jesus, yeah, we were. Yeah, I think we're going to have like kind of a mix of Transformers and G.I. Joe in this one, where we're just going to have some fun watching it and just kind of enjoy the cheese for what it is. You know what I mean? Just kind of yeah. enjoy it. So that's and my also re- yeah. and also Oh, sorry, Nigel, I didn't mean to step on your toes there. No, what were you going to say? I was just saying, for those new to the podcast, Nithix, by the way, is Nighthawks. We oh, call yeah. it Nithix because fuck that movie. I think Josh yes. started that. Josh started it. Yeah, that so. was that was my joke. But I it just it's it's so funny. Like I can't what see it now. Like it was, was it, it was just on it was just on TV the other day and I was like, hey, it's Nithix. <laughs> You're <laughs> welcome. Yeah. But anyways, but no, I've got fond memories of canon film movies for the most part. Hell, even kid me like Superman four, although adult me. Oh, hates same here. Oh that Jesus. Film. Jesus. <laughs> God, it's so bad. It's so bad. It's funny how like Superman four looks worse than Superman 1977. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, I'm just saying like, um, I think we're going to have fun watching this tonight. I really do. I think we're going to have a lot of fun watching it. All right. Hi. Well, um, just for reference guys, uh, Nithix was episode 67, 67 as part of our fire pit swings into adventure journey. That's right. Wow. Josh bringing up the trivia for those at home that want to go back and listen to that episode. Wink, wink. Well, I, I remember reading one of the things that a lot of podcasts should do is whenever they reference older episodes, tell them which episode it is. Ah, just like in episode 32 when we did the thing with the stuff. That was episode 65. That's same journey. But yes. Yes. So anywho, guys, 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 real quick, real quick, real quick. Yes. This is our 100th episode. Yes, it is. We have like officially recorded 100 episodes after tonight. Now, granted, by the time you listen to this at home, there will be 100 published episodes, but that means there we have actually recorded 101. But this is our 100th recorded episode because we lost selections section six way back in the day. Fuck you, Skype. And do we want to do our retrospective now or do we want to do that after the movie? I say we save it for after the movie. Yeah, I think, okay. I think, yeah, I think we can save yeah. it for after the film. Yeah, these people have been you know, chomping at the bit for us to watch this film. They've waited years for this moment. <laughs> they have. Seriously, like out of the last two years alone, they've gotten four episodes. <laughs> We're still doing better than in 2022. Yeah, that was the last time. We that was uh, the la- that was the year we didn't release an entire episode. I mean, we still have a better release schedule than insert show here, Tom. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I think we should save it for after the film. Yeah. Let's. Let's. Yeah. Like. I mean. Yes. Okay. I don't so, know what I was going to say there, but yes. All right then. Well. Um. I guess we will save that for afterwards. Josh has no idea what to say without a script in front of him. It's kind of amazing. Wow. Oh, I know what we could say. What's that? Tom, play the music. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> By the power of Grayskull! I have the power! Ah, much Much better. better. Welcome back to the fire pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and master of the universe, Tom. And speaking of the universes and their masters, we made it, everyone! The end of our Super Saturday Super Power Hour block. Our fight for freedom has transformed us into something truly outrageous. But are we Kenuff to take on one of the most legendary bombs of a cartoon adaptation, the Masters of the Universe? Tune in after this word from our sponsor to find out. And by sponsor, I mean the team and all the success they've been having with Constable Guillotine. Let's check it out. Welcome back. I'm rather not 
And this is the trial of the century, the United States versus the Fire Pit podcast, for their role in the violence caused by the latest batch of Constable Guillotine toys. We now go live to the congressional hearing already in progress. Another trial? Has it been 50 episodes already? The, 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 the chair recognizes Senator McCoy from Tennessee. Yeah, quiet. Now, now, boys, boys, it is my understanding now that you have been brought before this committee here to determine your involvement in this most horrific maiming of children through your toy distribution network. <laughs> yes, Senator, but we didn't sign off on these toys. But I have it right here, son. I have it right here. It says signed by Dan, Tom, and Josh. Is that not your names, sir? Oh, oh okay. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, those yeah. toys. Oh, right. shouldn't yeah. have put the winky face yeah, in there. Yeah, that, that is my signature. The chair recognizes Senator Dave Wilbos from Minnesota. I'm not sure that these three boys aren't some kind of grand conspiracy, don't you know? They definitely have the look, you know? What conspiracy? It's not our fault the kids didn't play with them, right? Who puts razor blades in their eyes? Come on! Kids are stupid! I I mean, stupid cute? The chair recognizes the senator from Maine, Mr. Hardison. No, listen here. Gentlemen, we have pages and pages of incidents from all over this country. Fingers cut off, eyes gouged out, and a bucket that doesn't run on batteries? But human blood! Chud the talking head bucket was like a last minute addition to the cast. And I'm not gonna name names, <coughs> Tom, but he was kind of both <laughs> Tom forced on us. Tom. Hey, I have it on good authority that Chud the talking head bucket, ch- he, he did very well in test. My mom liked Chud the talking head bucket. Hmm. <laughs> oh. Irregardless, this is all so dangerous and incredibly misguided. The American people and their children deserve better and safer toys. Cherish toys. God-fearing family toys. Like G.I. Joe, a real American hero. I mean, look at this thing. I mean, is the sword a guillotine? Or is the guillotine a sword? Yes. Yes. Gentlemen, gentlemen, in all my years in this chamber, I have never been so appalled by such blatant psychopathy. In the six months you've been producing these Constable Guillotine toys, you've sold several millions of merchandise, which has all maimed, crippled, and driven our children to such depravity. You've brought great shame to this great Christian nation of ours, don't you know? This smirched the name of all that is good and pure in this country, don't you know? Shame! But now... The real matter at hand, tax evasion. What? It says here you you have not paid your taxes, son. You have not paid taxes for any of the profits made on any of your merchandise. What, really? Like the taxes? You owe the US government millions of dollars. Millions, don't you know? So, nothing about the murders then? What murders? Nothing. Nothing. Enough, gentlemen, don't you know? (laughs) Quiet, this is a serious sentence. Mm, I think we have enough evidence and testimony here, don't you know, to completely shut down the Constable Guillotine show for good, don't you know? I will also amend to the resolution to force the Fire Pit podcast, don't you know, to pay back all damages to all families. Don't you know? Wait, what? what, Oh, for fuck's sake. Uh, So did we win? No, Josh, no. We lost. Big time. Yeah, we did. All right. I'm going to miss Chud. No, you don't. I'd also like to tack on a rider to this resolution, uh, giving us all a pay raise. <laughs> the system is stupid. It really is. Chud. You can't spell infamy without fame, right? Oh boy. But if you want some fame for your products, or if you have any movie suggestions that you think will get us famous, 
Or if you just want to tell us how famous you already know we are, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line as well as the subject of your mail whether it's to buy some ad space, correct us about a movie or journey we did or will do, or just to talk to us in a private fashion and pop it on over. From there we'll read it, be revealed magical secret powers, defend the heart of the universe from evil science wizards and their nefarious schemes, and never respond. Look, the center of the universe may be all around us, but the Wi-Fi is still lousy. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com, capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Keep pounding, you blistering barbarian! God damn it, can't a fella have five minutes? <laughs> I'm going to go defend the power of Grey Skull from the forces of evil. I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. Skeletor, seriously, this is the third time today, buddy. Get a hobby. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Canon. Are you guys watching? Is it, is it playing? Are we recording? We are recording, sweet. Cannot miss that Canon group intro. My god. I don't think I've been harder in my life. I'm leaving. <laughs> At the center of the universe stands Castle Grayskull. That seems like really bad real estate planning. Well, it's also bullshit because the center of the universe is literally everywhere. Has anybody not read anything on theoretical physics? I don't think theoretical physics ever plays a part in Masters of the Universe. Da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. So guys, we need to make a, a theme song for this one. How are we going to do it? Just sample from every other movie that we've made. <laughs> we did do a Superman one, right? Yes. Okay, but just change it just enough so no one will notice we stole from it. Change the key. <laughs> done and done, sir. I win. How long? Um, six or seven inches. Eight on a good day. It was a penis joke. Yes, I know. Monica, this is not... Hey! You look familiar. It's Monica! Changed. I've changed. Yeah, it's like nobody told her life was going to be this way. Oh, God damn it, Josh. Her job's a joke. She's broke. And her love life apparently is DOA. Josh, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nigel. Hey, man, I've been looking for See, you. See, the reason this is from the waist up is because he had a massive erection right there. <laughs> yeah, the loincloth hides nothing. Well, he actually didn't have the loincloth until after this scene because it was still being made. That's why they're all from the waist up. Until they show a full body picture, that's when they finally get finished the loincloth. See, we haven't seen the loincloth yet. No loincloth. There it is. I don't like Josh talking on these movies. <laughs> I can't believe this thing. I mean, did you see those lights? Oh my huh? god. Acting. <laughs> really? Where? I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> That is incredible! Oh, Looks like something out of Star Trek! What? Nothing. <laughs> oh my god, it is Tom Paris! Holy shit! Yeah, that's Tom Paris. Oh my god! The other character from that one episode of TNG. Oh shit, that reminds me. I wanted to show you guys something. If I hear a zip, I'm leaving. <laughs> zip? God damn it, I'm leaving. I promise you, Julie, I'll never leave you. Hey, hey, Dan, Dan, he said I'll never leave you. You know what that also means? Don't you dare, Josh. Don't you dare. <laughs> he's, he's saying I'll be there for you. <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. This, I could have suffocated in that lonesome shell. No, you couldn't have. You would have drowned, idiot. <clears throat> I wish I could change things. But you can't. That's something to help make you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Zip. <laughs> By the power. I missed all that exposition. Do we want to rewind it? No. Don't be afraid, I won't hurt you. Come with me if you want to live. No, 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 it's not come with me if you want to live. It's I'll be there for you. Stop God it. damn it, when Josh. The rain God, God to damn fall. it, Josh. Soldiers will free you. Also, T-Man is rocking that cape. 
Yeah. I know, right? The only thing is, is it is it a thong or a bikini back? Yes. So we're missing out on some uh, sweet, sweet 80s Dolph Lundgren right now. I'm disappointed. I mean, damn it! Said the quiet thing loud again. That's going in! <laughs> say goodbye to the place. I'm not going to be here for graduation. What do you mean? We're 24. Just mine! <laughs> she almost got double penetrated. Josh, one more. <laughs> one more penis joke, and we're done. We're, just in honey, we're half an hour into the film, and you've used up your allotted assortment. Press that red button in the front. Self-destruct sequence activated. <laughs> Let her go. <laughs> Why do I feel like it took Dolph Lundgren several takes to get that one? <laughs> I never told anyone this before. It's my fault they died. We know. I mean, that's sad, but we still know. Yeah, I know you've been through a great deal, but I need your help. She's like, I'll be there for you, because you're there for me, too. Oh, my God. Jesus, we still have an hour to go. Well, what happened? You don't never want to know. <laughs> okay, that's kind of fun. So does that mean he wants to know? You don't never want to know? Josh, he has a major concussion. <laughs> I don't think proper grammar's in the cards right now. So we're all supposed to go to the beach that day. There's a plane crash. Those things just happen. Where's the fucking beats that you need an airplane? Are you Taylor Swift? Jesus. <laughs> yes. Topical humor. My specialty. It runs on neutrinos now. No hydrocarbons needed. What are these words? <laughs> I know. I right, just stay there. We'll be right there, okay? Stay put, all right? Because I'll be there for you. Okay, you're done. You're done. You're done. You, you, you're done. You've hit quota. You're done. You're done. You're done. I'd rather you go back to the penis jokes at this point. <laughs> this is where they ambushed us. We've established a forward base. And we went to go get Azip. What's an Azip? Pizza spelled backwards. Oh, God. <sighs> Jesus. I'm going to put you away for 850 years. This is how Tom Paris ended up in that prison at the very beginning of Voyager. He, he held a gun on a cop. Ah. 850 years from this date. Is the beginning of that one episode of Voyager. Yes. Confirmed. It's canon. Canon. It's canon. Yeah, yeah. Films, LTD. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> I, I gotta include that one, damn it. Mother? Oh, honey, I've missed you so much. And I promised I'll be there for you. Jesus, <laughs> God, Josh. The horse is dead. He just finds something and he just drives it into the ground until it fucking comes up in China. I am master of the universe. Hey, he said the thing. I've got it. I've got it. I took 30 years for me to get that goddamn song out of my head. Uh, God that's damn it. it. Why didn't you tell me you were a song maker? Are you a master? Bader. Stop. <laughs> You've done enough, Josh. <laughs> Tom, we should start our own podcast, the Tom and Dan Not Josh podcast. I guess this is really goodbye, huh? We'll always be friends. Yeah. <sighs> oh. <sighs> Josh's commentary has actually made this movie worse than it actually is. Are you ready to deal now, proud warrior? The moon rises to its apex. Seriously, <laughs> stop ruining my moment. Tick. I stand before the great eye of the galaxy. Chosen. He just kind of goes on and on, doesn't he? It's like Tom giving the production. No, it's not nearly that long. <laughs> Thank you, my darling. No! Oh no, who could have seen this coming? Cursed your sudden but inevitable betrayal. <laughs> Man, it hasn't been her month, her week, or even her year. You! <laughs> Oh! Do you hear the Alpha and the Omega? Nick Langella is really giving it all here. Dude, nobody else can give 100% because <laughs> Frank Langella is giving, like, everybody else's 100%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lubick, you're really going to stay here, huh? Some kind of retirement, huh? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> you did literally nothing. In fact, you got in the way. He probably knows he's going to be brought up on charges when he gets home. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? I'm just going to stay where they definitely don't have an extradition treaty. All right, I'm just a stupid keyboard player in a high school band. Yeah, his job's a joke. He's broke. And his love life's gone away. It's like his life has always been stuck in second gear. And it hasn't been his day, his week, his month, or even his year. 
but he looks to Courtney Cox and says, I'll be there for you. When the rain starts to fall. Poor, but we'll, we'll allow it. And then he says, I'll be there for you. Like he's been there before. And he says again, I'll be there for you. And why is that, Dan? You both are idiots. <laughs> I love you guys. <laughs> and now, back to the episode. Oh my god! Oh, it's over! It's finally over! <laughs> this journey's finally over! This movie's finally over! Uh, we can go home now. Uh, we've closed the portal. It's done. I didn't think we'd make it. Oh, but we did it. We finally beat Masters of the Universe. So, Nigel, what did you think of this movie? Okay. Uh, as someone who watches movies with a critical eye, this is a very bad film. <laughs> <laughs> you this, don't say. It tracks. Trust me. Like This, this movie definitely... It's not good. Um, I, I can see why it be, how, why it's become a cult classic and why it's a little like beloved for nostalgia reasons. Um, unless you're already a fan of the Masters of the Universe, though, this is not the movie to convert you. Um, <laughs> seriously, no, it, it's not. It's just not. If like if if you just recently discovered Masters of the Universe because of either one of the Netflix shows or the the resurgence of the comic books or whatever, this movie's not going to be like. Oh my God, it's, this is not a must-see film. Not a hidden gem, no. Not a hidden gem, not a must-see film. It might be fun to watch for, like, I don't know, franchise purposes to kind of see how far it may have come or how far it fell. But no, this movie's not going to convert you. Um, it doesn't really follow the mythos, because I'm a huge fan of He-Man, so it doesn't really follow the mythos all that much, except for some of the characters' names and some of their behaviors. But for the most part, like, like I said, there's no Prince Adam. There's no big transformation sequence. Actually, the movie starts with the villains already winning. Mm -hmm. And and the budget, all of the hamstrings that were cut because of what the the studio and the producers were doing to the budget show in almost every scene in the film. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. it's so much of like, well, we got to film here because we don't have money to film anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Or like we joked it while we were watching the film, like, where are all the people in this town? You want to know why they didn't have any people in the town while the whole battle's going on? Because they couldn't afford to pay extras. <laughs> like, that's basically the reason why. You know, mm-hmm, it's like mm-hmm. a lot of the movie was filmed at night because they, they could not afford to film in the day because it's it's cheaper to shut the town off at night because most of the businesses are already closed. Because when you're going to film on like a street like that during the day, most of the time they actually have to pay some of the businesses to close and they got to pay them for like the whole day. Mm-hmm. You know, so they, they got to pay like, you know, if you own a shop, a little music shop or a little like card store or whatever like that. And they're like, hey, we're filming today. So we need to have you close because we can't have you guys having customers coming in and out. Um, Oh, well, I mean, uh, I usually make about like, you know, four thousand dollars a day. OK, well, we'll pay you four thousand bucks to close today. They can't Did afford I say four thousand dollars. I meant fourteen thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can afford that four D thousand. Dude, you just keep not hearing me. Yeah. So that's why. But if they film at night when the stores are already mostly closed, then they don't really have to pay anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, it it just shines in the budget. There's so much about it. Like the He-Man universe is big and massive and and awesome. Like Eternia is this big, fantastical, magical planet that is literally, Mm -hmm. at least in the mythos of the franchise, it's the center of the universe. And Mm -hmm. this movie felt like Eternia takes place in the center of a parking lot. Like I said, I have nostalgic charm for the film. I enjoy the movie for the charming narminess that it is, but it's not a good film. It's not a good film. Uh, yeah, no, I'll talk more later when we start getting into group thoughts. But uh, Josh, what about you? Okay, so um, this movie, let's just start by saying it's something that say. I think it falls well into that category of you want to watch it because you and your group of friends want to start a podcast and have this as a film on it. (laughs) I think it fits into that box very snugly. (laughs) An obligation film. Like um, we had this movie planned out for like August, 2022 when we had our old schedule up, I was going to be the, like, was it third journey of season three originally? 
I've always had that in the back of my head because we've talked about doing this as a destination film for over two years now, probably close to three. Mm-hmm. And I have not watched it. Like I've seen it on Netflix, but, and I, I probably would have watched it because like I said, in my expectations, I have fond memories of it because I remember enjoying it when I was a kid. It's probably going to be another 30 years before I watch this film. <laughs> um, actually, I don't know. Like this movie was dumb fun. It was definitely no tango and cash, but it's, it's like Guyver. I love Guyver. And even as an adult, like if, when I watch that movie, it's terrible, but oh my God, the fucking costumes and the practical effects, the costumes, not the practical effects were amazing. It's like the eighties and nineties knew how to do that. So the costumes in this felt fantastical. They felt otherworldly. The sets, not so much. The effects, definitely not. The acting was truly something out of this world. <laughs> in a bad way. <laughs> Are there any standout performances? Oh my God, Frank Langella. It's like I joked during the uh, movie that it's like the reason he's so good and he's giving so much is because he's taking acting from everybody else. <laughs> like his cup runneth over because everybody's pouring their acting ability into his glass. I think we figured out why there's no scenery in this film because Franklin Jella chewed all of it. All like, of it. <laughs> like like Skeletor is overweight the... because he ate everything. Yeah, that's why the sets look so sparse because Franklin Jella was eating all the scenery. In a good way, though. Like, yeah, have sure. at it, sir. You go ahead and eat up as much as you want. Have your fill. It's Lord like, knows no one else is bringing anything to this table. I mean, Dolph Lundgren did a job of being He-Man. Uh, he looked the part, that's for damn sure. Um, there was nothing. It's like I just went to a CC's pizza and ate like my body's weight in pizza and I realized that I haven't actually consumed anything. <laughs> there is no nutritional value in any of this. Yeah. I'm still hungry and I'm in pain. Oh, God. So the movie was not good, but... Um, I don't know. That's that's all. Like, I want to make another friends joke, but I'm just done. Stop. That's me applauding. That's Tom saying, "I'll be there for you." God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> to give his final thoughts, Tom, what's yours? How about yourself? Fuck this movie! <laughs> You're talking about bad fun. No, there was no fun in this movie. I was hoping this would at least be more enjoyable than Jam, but no. No, it was just a different flavor of bad. It just the acting, the pacing, the story, it, it didn't make sense. There were just scenes of stuff happening, and then just things happened, and they moved to the next scene, and they just had to jump to Frank Langella as Skeletor every so often, just so we would have some kind of acting going on, because otherwise it was just people running around. People running around. A thing was happening. People was running around. It was worse than Transformers. It was worse than G.I. Joe. It's just terrible. And I was hoping there would be at least some, like, decent music to this. No! <laughs> no! I, I can't remember the guy that did the score for this, but... Bill Conti. Thank you. And he's done some actually good stuff, if I recall. You couldn't tell from this, though. All of this stuff just sounded like generic knockoffs of someone else's generic knockoffs. <laughs> Truth. Yeah. Yeah. It was your basic canon, get it out there to get it out there feel. There wasn't even like, you know, that corny, like, say, hard ticket to Hawaii over the top. Just what the fuck just happened here? They couldn't even do that. I blame Mattel maybe for that because, you know, Mattel had rules and they had to follow it. Mattel had some serious handcuffs on this film. Yeah, budget and everything else. And you could, I just kind of felt it. There were some parts in it that felt okay. We were talking while we were watching it. The costumes were pretty cool. Mm -hmm. The makeup looked pretty cool. Um, The end fight scene was pretty all right for for what it was. But everything else was just, just painful to watch. Thank God for Frank Langella, because there was nothing else going on for this film. Just nothing. I, uh, I'm, 
I was hoping it'd be dumb fun, but it just turned out to be dumb. <laughs> oh, I mean, oh, this was just kind of a a summary of this journey almost. I, did it feel like to that to you guys? It just kind of encapsulated the entire journey. It just had all these films that were clearly cash grabs, but you had some that just they didn't know what they were wanting to do, or they really didn't have the budget to do what they wanted to do, or they just kind of just oh, then the audience is dumb. They don't care about this. Just throw it in. They'll eat anything. It's got their favorite ex cartoon character from when they were kids. Kind or is that just me? No, no, I can. Uh... Yeah, I can see that. Like, they needed to get a movie out uh, before the public eye turned away from He-Man, and it was already, like, yeah. 90% or 90 degrees, yeah. and it was mm-hmm. only in the periphery. And it's like, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Yeah, this this movie, like, it did not come out at the apex of mm-hmm. uh, the peak of He-Man's popularity. It came out basically as the franchise was winding down. Like, um, actually, there hadn't been a new episode in a while. The franchise itself had moved on to She-Ra, Mm -hmm. Uh, She-Ra was actually the current show and He-Man was a guest star on She-Ra. Like He-Man would very sparingly show up on She-Ra episodes. And then the toys themselves were were starting to lose their luster and popularity. Uh, Kids were actually moving on to Ninja Turtles, which also came out in 1987. Mm -hmm. Um, G.I. Joe was much more popular by this point in 1987. And as was Transformers. Transformers were also much more popular. So Ghostbusters. Well, that was a year later. Real Ghostbusters was like a real la- a year later or something like that. So He-Man was starting to wane in popularity. He-Man was at his peak of popularity about 1985 to 1986. And this movie comes out about a year after the uh, franchise starts to dip in popularity. Mm-hmm. And, and um, because the production was so troubled and because the budget was so cheap and because it only passingly bears a resemblance to the He-Man franchise, it didn't do anything to resurge the franchise. In fact, they took some of the elements from this film relaunched the show i think in 1988 or maybe 89 or something like that as the new adventures of he-man yeah 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 and um but that one only lasted a year that whole show only barely lasted a year the toys did not sell at all mostly because they actually made the toys in a different scale than the original masters of the universe toys so none of the figures could use any of the play sets or accessories from the old masters of the universe toys so parents so kids were pissed and mm-hmm. parents, were, parents were pissed off, too. So they made the new adventures of He-Man, but it flopped bad. It was canceled after less than a year. And the, yeah, the franchise kind of lingered in hell until about 2002 when it was relaunched as He-Man and the Masters of the Universe or something like that for Cartoon Network. But I um, remember that one. That was a good one. I yeah. like that one. But I never yeah, watched it. Yeah, well, actually, that one actually fell by the wayside because that show, while it was geared towards kids, uh, adults like me liked it better and the toys were more geared towards collectors. So collectors were buying up the toys and Cartoon Network kind of canceled the show because it's like, wait a minute, the wrong people are watching this. Hmm. So they just canceled it because it wasn't the right, quote unquote, right demographic. A lot of people think they should have kept the show going and just moved it to uh, Adult Swim. I agree. Instead of, I agree. Instead of well, just I'm glad to know that they definitely, whoever did, learned their lesson when My Little Pony was rebooted. Yeah. Why is this appealing to like 30 and 40 year old men? Fuck it. Keep it yeah. going. <laughs> are they yeah. buying our shit? Then yeah. why are we stopping? Exactly. Because the, 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 the toy line sold well and the show got pretty decent ratings. It was just mostly like kids weren't watching it and buying the toys for playing. And mm-hmm. so Cartoon Network and them decided to cancel the show because it wasn't really appealing to the right demographic. And a lot of fans at the time were just like, just move it to Adult Swim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they didn't. So whatever. Um, Another but, case of studios not getting it, much like with this movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, this film was... It could have been a lot better. Like the the plot they picked, just bringing it back to Earth, pardon the pun, but it almost felt like an episode of Star Trek. Well, look at all the movies that have come out since then, or even before. Your heroes coming to modern time Earth is nothing new, and it's been successfully done in the past. Barbie, most recently. Oh, yeah, it's like Star Trek has every single series has that one episode where they travel back to Earth and like... Yeah, it's a fish out of water episode. It's very... Yeah, but it's like, but it's, it's like a uh, unintentional period piece. Where it's mm-hmm. like, we're going to travel back to Earth in like the 1960s yeah. or the 1980s or the 1990s. Or- the He-Man mm-hmm. cartoon had actually done this successfully. The cartoon had an episode where people from Earth came to Eternia. Mm-hmm. And- I, I'm just saying like for this movie, it's like if they would have kept this one, I don't even know how they would have 
kept uh, this similar plot and having Prince Adam in it. Uh, well, I don't think there's a way you could do this plot and have Prince Adam. No. Uh, you know, one thing I will grant it, I do kind of like the movie starting off with Skeletor winning. Yeah, see, mm-hmm. now, I think you could do this plot with having Prince Adam because the plot opens up with Skeletor seizing Grayskull. Now he cuts He-Man off from the power, and he's Prince Adam, and then, like, most of the movie is him trying to get the power back. And then you can have your big moment at the end when he finally gets the power back and raises his sword to the sky and say, by the power of Grayskull, because now it's a two-hour version of an episode. Yeah, but yeah. then the catch is with that one, then you go two hours without He-Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, remember the most recent He-Man cartoon series. Dude. Right. Yeah. Right. In the, the first episode, you killed He-Man? Yeah, and most people who were mad about that never watched the rest of that series. They got mad at the first two episodes and were like, no, they killed off He-Man in his own show. And I'm like, watch the rest of it. The rest of it's fine. Like, it's basically a long version of the episode of a show, and then they, but they didn't watch it. I think yeah. we can review that later, but I think Kevin Smith could have saved himself a lot of trouble if they had just released both parts at the same time. Or release it on a weekly schedule like every other streaming platform is doing. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, also for that, too, it's like that's a free show. I'm not paying to see that show. I'm paying for the Netflix. I'm not paying to see that. Yeah. If I went to this movie to pay to see He-Man and for like an hour and a half, I didn't see He-Man, Kid Me would have been pissed. But the thing is, the show's not called He-Man. It's called Masters of the Universe. Yeah, and also, like, I get I get what you're saying. Like, I, I think maybe at the beginning of the movie, he's He-Man, and then, like, partway through, he gets cut off from the power, so he reverts back to Prince Adam. And then, like, the rest of the plot is him trying to get his powers back. They've done it successfully before. Yeah. You know, they've done movies like this before. There's, you know, Iron Man 3, you know, he has figured out how to do things without his armor. And mm. that movie made a bunch of money and got critically acclaimed. I didn't care for it, but a lot of people did. You know, you can do the, that particular type of movie i mean ooh, ooh, or even better even better as skeletor is getting more power he's loose he's transforming back into adam more and more so you can still have he-man but it's like now clock's ticking yeah but he's not guys gonna- let's not be armchair directors or writers or whatever like like we're, we're really deviating from talking about the movie sorry this movie really doesn't give us much to talk about except you know it sucked yeah dude yeah some of the effects weren't good i mean some of the effects all of the effects yeah, I was gonna yeah. say you're being generous with some. Like, but, but seriously though, it's just like the uh thinking about the movie, it's like the costumes were amazing. Hell, even Skeletor, even the close up shots of Skeletor, it's like I feel yeah, like he looked fun. He still holds up too. He like, still that, holds up. I mean, yeah, some of the movements is obviously like a mask that's glued to his face, but hell, mm-hmm. even his throne was pretty cool looking. You know, it's like there's details in that. I mean, in all the close ups to even the uh the mm-hmm. costumes for the bad guys, you know, the black stormtroopers. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, there weren't bad. It was the acting, the story, everything else about the movie that was kind of bad. Yeah, Yeah. I said in the, while watching, it had flavors of Flash Gordon to it. And just also a little bit of like the early 2000s Thor movie. Just bland and also poorly constructed. Just Yeah, uh, it's like the costume designers fucking love their job. I think even if they had a bigger budget, but they were still handcuffed by doing the whole fish out of water storyline. If they'd had more money, they could have done more with He-Man and the Masters of the Universe stuck on Earth for most of the movie. Like, mm-hmm. there were no interactions with people other than the two main characters. But like, there's no scene of like, yeah, I don't know, there's no scene of like He-Man walking into a, like a fucking grocery store, you know what I mean? Dressed like that. And everyone's like, who the hell is this guy? You know, what dressed like a barbarian or whatever. Yeah. Or yeah, 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 no, yeah. no scenes of man at arms trying to figure out earth technology. Cause that was his role in the show was he was like the technology guy. So yeah. like no scenes of man at arms, figuring out earth technology, no Tila getting hot headed at some dude coming on to her. You know what I mean? Like, or her in like a hunting store, like oogling at all the earth guns. Like, Ooh, I'll take yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but they weren't able to do any of this stuff cause they weren't able to afford it. Mm-hmm. So it was like, they, they couldn't have fought, they couldn't buy extras. They couldn't rent out stores to film in stores. Like they couldn't interact with anyone else other than the paid actors and actors actresses that they were already going to be interacting mm-hmm. with so yeah, it's like mm-hmm. all the extras was at the beginning of the film yeah again you know everyone take a drink audience take a drink because dan's about to make a star trek reference here no but, they're drunk star- if they're taking a drink <laughs> star- star- well no if they had to take a drink every time you mentioned friends um or i did made the whole star trek joke yeah, about- see, they would be drunk yeah okay anyways take another drink i don't care if your liver's going dead star trek 4 the voyage home came out the same year as this movie star trek 4 the voyage home has really great fish out of water moments with the 
the Enterprise cast. Yes, it really does. You know, mm-hmm. the, whole, the whole double dumbass on you when Kirk gets almost gets run over by the taxi. Yep, yep. You know, and the guys watch it. You dumbass. He goes, well, uh, well, the double dumbass on you. Yeah, Spock yeah. doing the Vulcan nerve pinch on the the punk rocker that's blasting the radio in the bus and everyone applauding him. Yeah, um, Chekhov being interrogated by the. Uh, cop and he's using his russian accent and the cop's like you know obviously doesn't believe a thing Chekhov says because a he's talking nonsense to this guy because he's from the future and all that and two he's russian <laughs> yes. and he's he's russian breaking into a nuclear uh, aircraft carrier which at the Wessel. time was very highly nuclear classified Wessel. yeah a nuclear vessel which was very highly classified information at the time <laughs> so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um so like there's great fish out of water moments in that movie now granted i know star trek the voyage home had a much higher budget than masters of the universe but i'll point another movie out that's kind of a cult classic i don't know if you guys have ever seen it but it's a movie called beast master 2 through the portal of time that movie also had a tight budget but they had multiple scenes of dar who's the beast master guy going mm-hmm, mm-hmm. through modern Los Angeles and getting like really weird stares. You know what I mean? And like having great fish out of water moments. Like he doesn't know how to talk to people in modern LA and stuff like that. Like, no, you can't, dude. but it's like the movie had an hour and 45 minutes. If you would have added an extra 15 minutes, you could have filled in all that stuff and it would have been a decent movie. Yeah. You could have see where like he man, like does something and there's a kid and kids looking up at he man going, Whoa. And yeah. he just gives him that smile and that yeah, kind of wink. Yeah, because now that you mentioned that, it's like He-Man in this movie didn't really do anything spectacular. No. And that could be because of uh, Dolph Lundgren and um, his, uh, let's just say, range or lack thereof. Well, not even that. I mean, it's like he didn't like lift any cars. Let's put it like this. Schwarzenegger in Twins was more of an extraordinary human being than He-Man was in his own movie. Yeah. yeah, up until the final battle when he he drops that pillar on some people and manages to overcome Skeletor's magic to pull the sword out of his... Two uh, things, yeah, thing. two things. He doesn't really do two much He-Man stuff in the film. So you're right, you're right. Like, this is a guy that routinely in the cartoon and in the comics and all this stuff, like, lifts up boulders and mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. can best almost anyone in straight. He's the most powerful man in the universe. It's right there in the freaking title. But, um, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it just kind of feels like they just, he didn't do enough of He-Man stuff in this film. But you're right, Josh. And then, again, the budget and the producers are like, I think Tom, when he was talking about the production at the beginning of the, the show, was mentioning, like, they just couldn't get out of their own way. No. Mm-hmm. They did everything they could to sabotage their own production. Yeah. It's like, we don't think it's going to work, so we're just going to take away the, mo- the the money you need to make this work and, you know, have idiots rewrite your script. So anything cool yeah. that you were going to do, no, no. Well, what's funny is, is Canon, Canon actually got the rights to Spider-Man at the same time they got the rights to Masters of the Universe. Hmm. So they oh, wow. made a Masters of the Universe film and they were going to make a Spider-Man film. In fact, the VHS for Masters of the Universe contained teasers for Spider-Man. Like, not actual movie production because they hadn't filmed anything yet, but there was like, like they had like a little animation that showed Spider-Man shooting his webs or something like that. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the rumors are that they kept budget back from this film so they could put more money into Spider-Man. Unfortunately, Spider-Man never got made because this movie bombed so bad. They lost so much money on it. They did, they couldn't afford to make Spider-Man. The blessing in disguise. But we don't know, though. If they just sunk more money into this and it had been a bigger hit, oh, probably they could have made Spider-Man. You know what I mean? Like, and we don't know how good or how bad it would have been. It probably wouldn't have been very great, but... We never got a Spider-Man movie in the 80s or 90s because this movie flopped so bad. True, true. And again, looking at Canon's filmography, I, I question... It would not have been good, Tom. I'm not saying Spider-Man would have been a good film. I'm saying they never <laughs> got... are grateful that uh, it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, we're grateful to think this movie was a bomb and they couldn't. Time Travelers came back to 1987. It's like, we've got to destroy the He-Man movie. It's the only way. Destroy He-Man, save the universe. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much that. Yeah. If I'm going to give this film any kind of praise, very faint praise, at least it did try to capture a bit of the spirit of the cartoon series. As much as it could. I can agree with that. Yeah, I mean, we look, I compare this to Bar... Not Barbie, but... um, um uh, Gem and the Holograms. Gem tried its damnedest to make a competent film, but it, it was focused so much on the body of the film, it lost the spirit. It was just a hollow, joyless shell. This sucked. This movie sucked. But at least this one tried to at least get the spirit right. 
And so I, I got to give them that much. They they try to make it a He-Man film. As you could tell that it's it. like the everybody wanted to make a good movie, but mm-hmm. they couldn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's like everybody wanted it to be successful. Everybody tried. It's like the thing where, once again, the boardroom ruined the movie. It's like the sequel trilogy could have been great had Mm -hmm. the board not been involved. Fucking uh, Batman v Superman could have been great, but this could have been great, but it was the exact opposite. They kept taking money away instead of giving the money, giving it the money it deserved. Yeah. We, you know, we Mm -hmm. were, we made a good joke during the watch section, Josh, where you were like, I can do this, but I need $30 in 15 minutes. And we're like, you're going to give you $15 in 30 minutes. Yeah. That's, pretty much what they would do. They were like, you know, I need a couple thousand dollars to do this shot in two days. We're going to give you four hours and we're going to give you 500 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, what, what we I- lose the stage in 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. We can let you have the lights. That's all we can give you. No. Right now. Oh, wait, we just ran out of budget. You don't get the lights. Fuck. Who's yeah. got a flashlight? <laughs> can we at least keep the smoke machine? So I guess we're all in agreement then that this movie was bad. Could have been better. We'll never know. And... Uh, I guess that's all we have. Like, I, mean, I guess that we're kind of in agreement there. Yeah. This movie yeah. was bad, really bad, and disappointing. Very. Oh, Jesus, so goddamn disappointing. But Would you even yeah. consider it fun? No, I do. I, I consider it fun. I think if you're like Dan and you're a big fan of Masters of the Universe, I think you could consider, I, I think you could have nostalgic love for this movie. I have love for it because of the... Frank Langella in it and all that. Yeah, and like, oh, yeah. And I, I don't blame Dolph Lundgren for the movie not being good. It's not his fault. It's really not his fault. Now we're, and mm-hmm. I am glad that this version of He Man is starting to be somewhat redeemed in the pop culture of the Masters of the Universe fan base. Like they're not so harsh on it anymore, you know. And then like Dolph Lundgren himself is even starting to come around saying, yeah, it's like, yeah, I'd, I'd like to be He Man again. I'd, I'd be happy to do that again or something like that. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm happy they're being redeemed. But. Like, honestly, I could see somebody liking it because pure nostalgia. But anywho, um, so 100 episodes, guys. It has been 100 episodes, yes. Yeah, it has been. Th- however many years in 100 episodes. We I'm... have done recorded 100 episodes. And hopefully by the time you've listened to this, we've released 100 episodes. Hopefully. Yes. Well, no, the answer is yes. We're not going to wait till the last second to do it, right? Right? This is when Tom inserts something because we recorded this <laughs> back in like February. But seriously, guys, props to us. We actually stuck it out and filmed 100 fucking episodes. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm proud. I'm happy. Yeah, go us. We beat the odds, guys. We did it. There's actually a thing where most podcasts don't make it to 100 because the creators get mad at each other and stop making it. That did not happen with us. That, that never that happened never with us at all. No. No, no way did that ever happen. That is lies and conjecture and uh, false news. False news, fake news. Fake Hashtag news, fake, fake news. news. Yeah, fake we, news. Uh, we we just had a short break between episodes. Year, years. A short hey, No, there was, years it break. was it was greater than one year. It was greater. I mean, we went from December 2021 to March 2023. I mean, in our defense, life also kind of happened. It yeah, was... we're, we're actually joking. It wasn't even so much infighting or arguing. It was really just life. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the, the pandemic ended and the world went back to normal. And so we had to go back to normal too. And yes, we did have some uh, disagreements during our last journey. And we always joke that Ghostbusters Afterlife broke us. It but... did. It really did. It did. It did. But all it honesty... Did. We needed to find a balance mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with the new format. I feel like we are, we have a balance. Yeah, oh, yeah. I definitely feel, I definitely feel the new format has a lot more balance to it. has a lot more ways of us to, uh, you know, like I said, balance real life with podcast life and stuff like that. And then I, I like it a lot better. It's a lot more laid mm-hmm. back and we don't feel so stressed. You know, we were putting a lot of pressure on ourselves mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it was pressure that we didn't have to put on ourselves because we don't answer to anyone, but the three of us. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, plus this format, we can, you know, when we're watching movies, we bring things that, you know, complement one another. And just kind of like everyone has something to bring to the table. And it's, we all get either enjoy it or be miserable by it. Either way, it's all of us combined, like a 
thing that forms and trans what what are those things? I'm trying to Voltron. think of the word. There we go. Yes. Actually, I was trying Voltron. to think I was trying to joke about I couldn't think of Transformers, but Power yeah, Rangers. like a Voltron. Ooh, that's more relevant. Yes. <laughs> yes, but our powers combine. We create the Fire Pit Podcast. And it's just a brilliant. few more references there, Tom. We're cool. Just a few yeah. more. I think Keep I can going. fit one more. I think I can one fit one more. At more. least, I at can, the minimum. I, I can form the head. Um, Star Trek. <laughs> what? <laughs> Got Nothing. it in there. <laughs> but yes, but I'm loving it. This is a hundred episodes. I... Dude, a hundred fucking episodes. Dude, what's crazy is this year is an election year, and our first year we started producing was an election year. I mean, granted, a year and some months in there, we weren't a thing, but we have been out there for four years now almost say, four years i will say this though i know that you know we, we don't have a very busy discord right now and whatnot because we took so much time off and we've lost some people that were listening to us but we do have a small dedicated group of fans that have waited with bated breath for us to release new content and i actually was truly humbled you don't think you could get humbled by only like well, only five people listen to you dude five people care about what i have to say about movies you know like (laughs) i don't you know i don't care if it's five or five hundred that's to me is humbling Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. five people care about what we think about movies and couldn't wait for us to make new episodes about what we think about movies so yeah seeing like when we released our new episode a couple of weeks ago our our latest selection section and seeing the the people in discord rob tarek thorne danielle getting super excited about it was like to me, very humbling, very humbling that those mm-hmm. people cared about what we have to say about movies and couldn't wait for us to make new content. Yeah. There's three guys just putzing around, making fart jokes, drinking beers and watching movies. And for whatever reason, they still like it. So thank you to all our dedicated listeners. And even if you are a new li- new listener, thank you. 100 episodes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we have a yeah. few more of those. Yeah. Yeah. Whether or not this is your first episode with us or your 100th episode with us, thank you, man. That's just been great. You know, somebody yeah. else cares what we have to say about movies. And if whether you agree with what we say or you disagree with what we say or you just think it's all nonsense, I love the fact that someone actually cares what we have to say. Yeah. And yeah. We at least entertain. We just entertain you for an hour or two, however long the episode is. Something to listen to in the car or in the plane or on the way to work or something like that. It's just, it's good. It's good stuff. I, I love the fact that, you know, people actually care. Yeah. And to you new listeners out there who are just now jumping on the bandwagon, another hundred episodes. You're along for the ride too. This next hundred is going to take a little bit longer to get to, but we'll try. Yeah, the last time we got, I think, up to 80 before we were like, we're not releasing these once a week anymore. <laughs> no, no, it was like, dude, it was like 93. Yeah, something like that. We got, we were releasing an episode once a week, then, which was easy to do during the uh, pandemic, but uh, not so easy to do now. So No, no. Yeah, up to episode 91. 91 was the last weekly release episode. I mean, it's monthly now, but we're back at it. <laughs> we are. So we now get, okay, so we did it weird this time when we recorded our uh, journey. So we recorded all of the movies back in like January, February time frame. So the meat of it was done and recorded. And then we decided we were going to take our times and we wanted to fully produce the skits. Well, we didn't. So <laughs> that, that was the hanger on. And that's why most of the episodes were delayed because we couldn't get find a time to get together and talk for two hours. Well, whose and, fault uh, is that? Guys who have jobs that send them around the world and give them very big responsibilities. Hmm. You're not wrong, but anywho, we always have this retrospective when we do it, but we're recording this one now, like months after we have recorded the main content for the stories. And so we've actually listened to the skits because we couldn't obviously record this back in February when we recorded this episode. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and start with Nigel. What do you think of the skits? They were creative. You know, this is a different take for us. Like our old format was, you know, each episode we get together and come up with a skit for each episode. And then we'd we'd, we'd watch the movie, record the skits, do all that stuff in the same night. And, you know, obviously our recordings used to be like four or five hours. And we used to start at like what? seven o'clock eight o'clock yeah and like you know sometimes we wouldn't get done until like you know one two three in the morning but 
this time around, like we recorded, obviously like Joshua, we recorded all the movies and then we decided to do the skits and we came up with the general idea for each skit together. Like we, we got together at Josh's house and we sat around smoking cigars, literally smoking cigars and being like, okay, what's the first skit? And then we do like, a, we did like an outline of the first skit. And then we like, what's the second skit? We did like an outline for the second skit. So like we kept the story cohesive, at least as cohesive as our skits get. And just kind of kept it going that way. And then mm-hmm, we did mm-hmm. potatoes of the skit later. Like we came up and it's like, okay, now that we understand what the outline of skit number one is going to be, let's sit down and write it together. And then so the three of us get together and be like, okay, the, the cold open, the interspersal, the stinger is going to be this. So I, for one, loved this format because mm-hmm. I think it allowed the creative process to be a little more free. And I think it allowed us, since we were all working on them in real time at the same time, it allowed for less, um, you know, like, oh, why do you guys think my jokes suck kind of stuff? So I really liked these skits. I really did. I, you know, I, I thought they were quite fun. And I thought they were a nice little return to the, hey, guys, we're back kind of fire pit stuff. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, I think mm-hmm. looking back historically over our skits, we have had some good ones, some bad ones, some great ones. And I think the majority of our great ones was uh, the ones that we collaboratively wrote oh yeah 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 just mm-hmm. just a giant brain mess of us three together yeah oh the, some of these skits in this journey have been fantastic and i've liked the idea too of having um the ongoing um kind of mythic arc of the constable guillotine kind of as the interspersal but the sandwich between the skits that had to deal with the movies themselves which was the advantage of having watched the movie before we wrote the skit. Because then we knew it's like, hey, this happened and this, this, and this. Um, We want to riff on that. We want to make that part of the theme. We just kind of went from there. So it made for a lot of uh, skits that felt like they fit the whole everything. So it was been a great time. I've had a blast. Yeah, same here. I've had a lot of fun doing these. I, I did like the format of like the cold open is like that's related to the movie. And then the interspersal is the running gag throughout the journey of the journey. And then the, the stinger was kind of sort of whatever the hell we wanted it to be. <laughs> Pretty much. So. Just evolved into us just like riffing and just bullshitting at the end. Yeah, yeah. I like, yeah, just, I like that stuff. I always love how our cold open, it relates to the movies. Mm-hmm. And I like in this one, how we made that happen. Then we was able to just kind of do the Constable Guillotine side story and the interspersal. Mm-hmm. Which I love. I always like the the journeys that we have that have kind of um, a storyline to them. Yeah. That way, when you go back, if ever we like, well, we've been, we've done it in the past. We've taken the skits and combined them together into like one big episode. It just makes it feel more like. I compare it to kind of like Linkara from um, um, Atop the Fourth Wall. He kind of does similar things with his. So it's like, hey, we have a storyline. We Something that could be a whole episode of a thing. And yeah. I kind of like going back and listening to those too. Yeah, and, and I, I like doing this session all together. Because like, I mean, honestly, while we're recording this, we just finished up the uh, last episode of Masters of the Universe. So we did that sketch and we just wrote it on the fly tonight, right before recording. And it's like, Josh is the one that comes up with like, oh, we should do callbacks to some of our previous skits because this is our mm-hmm. 100th episode. And I'm like, I didn't even think about that, but we did. And then it's like, it makes it even funnier. Mm-hmm. And someone just has like an epiphany moment and we're all just getting like, oh, yes, yes, yes. Get it down. Type it, yeah. type it, type faster. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I think there, I think this format of us doing skits has been fun. It's been a lot more like creative. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. it's allowed us a little bit more freedom so hopefully we do it this way going forward with our next journey so but we're getting away from like actually reviewing what we thought about them okay well I, i'm gonna say right now my favorite one so far was the gem and the holograms one that was one the editing was just top notch nice work tom fantastic mm-hmm. Two, the musical numbers are very in character and very hilarious so good stuff love it but uh, I'll just that's all I'll say. And I also love that we kind of came in and I mean, that was our musical episode, too. So just coming in and Josh, you had the ideas. We should do this song, this song, this song. Just 99 percent of the singing stuff was just off the cuff written at the moment. And just mm-hmm. I couldn't have planned it better myself. Lord knows I wanted to try, but God knows it wouldn't have been any good. It would have been a fraction of as good as it turned out. So that was a choice decision on your part, Josh. And Dan, you come in through, it's like, I'm not singing. It's like, you're correct. That's your arc in this one. It was just perfect. 
<laughs> oh yeah, that was that was a fun one that we enjoyed. Yeah, and it's so far and away from our original idea, or even the first one that you wrote about. Yeah, because you wrote a uh, cold open, and we're all like, "Let's do it this way." <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't. We didn't. We liked it. It's just one of these things. Like, what if we did it this way? And well, honestly, was... Tom got really enthusiastic about it. There, Tom's like, "No, no, 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 no. Here's my idea. Here's my idea. Oh. Going in the trash can. Now we're going with your idea." <laughs> no, but the best thing we have to say about that one is. Dan was on vacation when me and Tom came up with that idea. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> and because the original idea for the skit was going to be, I was going to sing, Dan was going to sing, and then Tom was going to go stupid with his chud singing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. Dan gets on the call because we hadn't written it out yet. And then uh, me and Dan- Tom had a sit down where we were just talking about it. And he writes the script. And it was a, it wasn't in line with what I felt like we had discussed. So when we started talking about it, I'm like, well, we need to do this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. And then Dan gets on the line. And what you hear in that <laughs> skit was legitimately what he was saying when he logged in. He's like, This is stupid. I'm not doing it. No. <laughs> I'm not saying You want me to sit you want me to what now? Well, so I, was we getting decided- nerv- I was getting nervous because, uh, you know, I, even though I was on vacation, I wasn't really responding to messages. I was still seeing them on my phone and every now and then I see Tom's like, OK, we should be good to record next week, guys. I just got to finish writing the musical number. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I'm three states away. What? <laughs> <You know? laughs> see, my idea, I thought I again, I had misinterpreted what we had talked about, Josh. I thought it's like, OK, you all will record your singing stuff separate and I'd be piecing it together. I didn't think we'd be doing one long like recording session. So it wasn't so much me throwing it in the bin. It was just me also looking at the skit going, yeah, this isn't going to work. We need to improvise. Boom. New plan. Yeah, it was brilliant. Like I said, ten out of ten. Well, yeah, Dan. Dan came on, started saying what he was saying, and then we just kind of collectively came to the decision that's like, okay, this is the punchline for the rule of three. Yeah, Dan's not gonna sing, like, because Dan just doesn't want to sing. No, it was beautifully executed and collaboratively wrote. Yes. But honestly, all of our skits was good, but that was definitely the best of them. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll run down the skits like in a more detailed episode, May, maybe even like the season finale where we go through all of our stuff. But if we're just picking one baby to be our favorite baby, that's also mine. She's pretty and she's got her daddy's eyes. So I love her. I will say our 100 episodes. It's been a fun journey. and that's tonight's show as a reminder you can find us on firepitpodcast.com there are links to spotify itunes amazon or wherever fine podcasts are sold please like and subscribe to whatever medium you choose we really appreciate it and it helps us out and also when you get a chance you know be sure to give a review on the podcast that also helps get eyes on the prize give it a thumbs up a star uh, a squealy wiggly diggly thing i don't know what twitter slash x is doing anymore but anything else that lets people know hey this is a podcast worth checking out so they will check us out and be sure to join our discord channel as well talk to all those cool people that we always name drop links in our episode description or head over to discord.me slash fire we have things set up so you can get notified when we do release a new episode and you can engage with us and those fans about uh random ass shit that we talk about and episodes and episodes you can do that too <laughs> good job josh Thank you. 100 episodes in, we finally got it. Uh, you can also email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Also like our page on Facebook. Follow us on, can we dead name Twitter? Or are we still calling it X? What can we do? We don't even use it. We're not really using it. At CCE. Both are linked in the episode's description as well. Like I said, uh, we're, we're trying to get better with the social media, but be sure to email us if you want to. And uh, yeah, just any, t- any way you want to try to reach out to us. Any way you want it, that's, that's the, way, the way you need it. Yes. Do, 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 do. Tom, you got any shout outs? Um, I'm just going to repeat what you guys have been saying. Thanks, everyone out there. You've been with us since the beginning. Some of you have been with us since the middle. Some of you were just now joining us. And, and I'm still surprised. We've been like on hiatus for, what, a year or two now. And we're getting more new followers. So for those of you that are coming in during the break, thank you, too. Just... The, for the old and the new and the borrowed and the blue couldn't be here without you yes i'm not gonna specify anybody else i'm right there with you tom just shout out to the listeners in general 
thank you guys for uh, giving us an excuse to uh, make this. Same here. I'll say it again. Only four or five people want to hear what we have to say. Or I mean, not, not we have more listeners than just a four or five, but they, they're always so excited to hear from us. Like they're the ones in the discord and all that stuff. And I'm just like, if they're the only ones listening, that's awesome. I don't care. Like it's just to me, it's humbling. So my shout out again would be the fire pit listeners. So during the recording of the uh, skits for this episode, uh, we lost Donald Sutherland, a great actor who's not been featured on our podcast a whole lot of times, but we are hoping to change that here in the near future. But uh, just a, a little word, because this guy is like one of the pillars, one of the pillars of Hollywood, one of the pillars of, of, of uh, acting. And we just wanted to give him a quick shout out because the guy was great. Um, he is one of, if not the best actor to never be nominated for an Academy Award, which Tom and I were discussing is an absolute crime and who's ever responsible for that should be tried accordingly. But the man had a career that spanned six decades of just solid work. He was always working. He did any kind of movie from big budget productions like The Hunger Games, which is probably where most people would recognize him from now today. But he did lower budget horrors like the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which was his probably his most famous role. Um, He worked with almost any big director you can think of, guys like Ron Howard in Backdraft, Clint Eastwood in Space Cowboys, Oliver Stone in JFK, and Joel Schumacher in A Time to Kill. And most of those movies would be listed on anyone's best of list. Um, He's also shared the screen with some of the biggest and most well-known actors and actresses of our time, actors and actresses we have featured on our podcast in one way or another, Uh, Anthony Hopkins, Clint Eastwood, Tommy Lee Jones, Michael Douglas, Lee Marvin, Michael Caine, Kevin Costner, Gary Oldman, Sandra Bullock, Leonard Nimoy, Samuel L. Jackson, Jamie Lee Curtis, and Jennifer Lawrence, and many, many, many others that would take me hours to read all who we shared the screen with. And one last thing about Donald Sutherland, just a little bit of trivia I thought was fun. Um, He's also been in two films that were mildly successful movies, developed cult followings, but then later were transformed into much more successful and well-known TV shows that Donald Sutherland wasn't a part of, but the movie, he was in the original movies. The first one is MASH. He was the original Hawkeye. Uh, And then he was the original Watcher uh, in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which later was spawned into a massively successful TV show. So just uh, rest in power, I think is what they say now. Rest in power, Donald Sutherland, because he was one of the all-time greats. Um, also, he, he's also very well known. He's the, he's the father of Kiefer Sutherland, a, an actor that a lot of people know today from a, definitely the TV show 24, multiple movie roles. Um, and yeah, so there you go. Save so a life. fine actor who also produces other fine actors. There you go. Yep. The legacy will live on. And one last shout out. I don't mean to end things on a somber note, but I did want to make this shout out tonight. Um, at the time of this recording, Carl Weathers recently passed away. We had him not on the show, obviously, as a person, but we had him on Rocky. We, when we watched Rocky, Carl Weathers on Rocky, and we all agreed while watching Rocky, well, while Rocky is a great film, Carl Weathers was really good in that film. Like, And he was just good in everything he did. And I don't normally get sad or sentimental about most celebrity deaths. I just don't. Like, I, I don't really celebrity worship or anything like that. But Carl Weathers' death kind of hit me a little bit because I enjoyed his movies. I enjoy everything he did. He could play funny. He could play serious. He could be a tough guy. He could be a soft guy in movies. So he had really good range as an actor. And so I don't think the Rocky movies would have been as successful without Carl Weathers. Plus, he's also in like Predator. I mean, that's where the bro handshake comes from. Like yep. the, the, the meme. Yeah, the uh, meme handshake yes. comes from him. Happy and, Gilmore. Uh, yeah, Happy Gilmore, where he, like I said, plays a funny guy. So yeah, Carl Weathers, I, I was really sorry to hear about his passing. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully we do more Carl Weathers films in the future. We need to. We will. We will. And for those listeners waiting for that, just don't worry. We'll be there for you. When the rain starts to fall. We'll be there for you. Come on, Dan. Like we've been there before. We'll We'll be be there there for for you. you. One, you're singing it off key. Like way off key. Um, two, stop. Just stop. That's a weird say way to say because you're there for us too. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> and thank you for listening. I've been Tom. We don't want to give a hint to the next episode like we always do or the next journey. Tom. 
No, they're going to have to tune into the selection section to find out. Well, do you want to give a little bit of a hint to where we're going next? I don't think we know yet, do we? Do we know where we're going? I don't know. Maybe we've been brainwashed. Oh, no. To not know, to not remember. I'm, I'm just trying to think. I, I, I remember something about going af- afar there, like some kind of foreign country. Like, oh, was it Manchester? I'm trying to... I can't recall. Marmaduke. It's just like... We're going to Marmaduke. That sounds about right. That sounds... That, that actually mm-hmm. makes a yep. lot of sense. That's a great candidate for our next journey right there. Yes, you're right. <laughs> Did you forget what we were going to, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't actually sure if we had finally decided on... That was what I wanted to do. So uh, as far as I'm down, I'm down with that one. I'm 100% down with... Yeah. I've got movies to pick. Oh, yes. Oh, I've already got a few movies figured out that I want for uh, my first movie in there. So we'll have to discuss like that before we record our next selection section. All right. Well, fly me to the moon and we will see you next time. Until then, I've been Tom. I've been Josh. And I've been Dan. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Good luck out there. That's IT, this is Dan. I need a few things. Hmm. A Masonic Tesseract, an Octoad Rectifier, and something to play the tones of. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Uh, that is not really something we support. Uh, but let me get you over to our server team just to be sure. NAS IT, this is Josh. I call it the Cosmic Key. The tones it generates can open a doorway to anywhere. That is not our product. Sir, this is NASA. NASA. Please contact your uh, local help desk. I'll patch you through. NASA IT, this is Tom. You are to go through to this world where they are hiding. Find the key. Do as you wish with the others, but bring He-Man back alive. Why do I always get the weird ones? Sir, you have the wrong support line. The number you need is in the manager's office. It's different at every location, though, so, um, thank you for your call. I will be back. Yeah, I'm sure. Please fill out the survey. Thanks. Weirdo. Dude sounded like he was about four feet of shit piled three feet high. I mean, by the tone of his voice, it sounded like he should have been calling the sex offenders hotline, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seriously. I could, I could hear the mustache on him. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Oh, shit. We weren't muted. Yeah. No. Hey, anyone else notice that giant portal outside our window? No, I'm not really into sports. Who? <laughs> 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 God damn it. <laughs> I'm not really into sports. <laughs>